Wow. Good evening. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amy, and I would like to welcome all of you and uh, all of you here and all of you watching at home uh, to the Fayetteville Public Library's author talk this evening. Before we get started, please note the feedback forms in your chairs. If you would be so kind as to take time to fill those out and share your thoughts on tonight's program, we would appreciate the efforts. We want to encourage you to offer programming suggestions as well. If you would like to see a specific author talk or if you have an idea for a program here at FPL, feel free to write it down now on the forms or you can visit our website and under how do I, there is an option for contact FPL. Comments, requests, feedback are all welcome here too. If you would like to do a program here at FPL, maybe about Sasquatch, <laughs> um, you can feel free to also go to our website for that. And under events, there is an option for program proposal. Here you can fill out the form of your program idea. Your feedback does help us plan future events. As far as upcoming other upcoming events, Thursday on September 22nd at 6 p.m., we are happy to announce our first intermediate genealogy workshop. Our intermediate, intermediate workshops will have a bit of a scavenger hunt and then an in-depth look into our collection and some various websites to help you with your family history research. The one on the 22nd will be about various types of censuses. Saturday, September 24th at 10 a.m., we will have an introduction to genealogy workshop. Here you will see a quick demo on Ancestry.com, learn the tools to use with the people that can help you use them, and tour the Grace Keith genealogy collection. On Tuesday, October 18th at 5.30 p.m., uh, another author, Frank Head, will discuss his book, The Possibilities of All Things. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce our author tonight. By the way, this room speaks volumes about who we're about to hear. Um, Dr. Brooks Blevins is a Noel Boyd Professor of Ozark Studies at Missouri State University in Springfield. He is a native of the Ozarks, tracing his roots deep into the antebellum era in both Arkansas and Missouri. He is here tonight to talk to us about the last book in his trilogy, A History of the Ozarks, The Ozarkers. Please help me welcome Dr. Brooks Blevins. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. I think I'm hooked up to the, to the mic, but uh, let me know if anybody has trouble hearing. I'm just gonna kind of wander around, maybe fall off the stage a couple times. I'm already a little worried about that. Uh, but it's, it's great to be uh, back in Fayetteville. It's been several years since I've been here at the, at the library. And of course, we've had uh, some things going on in the, in the time in between. And so it's good, it's good to be anywhere where you can talk to groups of people and, and crowds and rooms and all that kind of stuff. And I'm especially glad to be able to talk about this last book. It's a, uh, it's a, this trilogy took me uh, the better part of a decade to do, uh, to research and, and write. And uh, sometimes I, I wonder just, uh, I can't even remember what, what else I did in the last 10 years. Besides, it seems like I was just always in that shed working, uh, working on, on these books. But it's, it's good to have them finished. I'm not going to be able to, uh, and I wouldn't even try, to, to encapsulate everything in the book. It's, it's a book that covers from the late 1800s into the 21st century uh, around the Ozarks of Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, I even mentioned Kansas a couple times in case we get any Kansans out there. Uh, so they're not even left out of the Ozark story. But what I want to do uh, tonight is just tell a couple stories, talk about a couple things that have to do with the image of the Ozarks and look, in, look at how that has changed here in the 21st century. You know, those of us, uh, most of us have been around long enough to know 
if you're around long enough, you realize how things change, how, how quickly things change. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it's quick. Sometimes you just sort of wake up one morning and you realize, you know, I haven't seen anybody dressed like Grandpa in, <laughs> in, in, in at least 15 years. I, I, it, just, it just dawned on me recently that the, uh, that the overall crowd uh, is gone. It's gone. You know, there are a few people who, who are who are wearing overalls in sort of a revival fashion, uh, but but they're not people who grew up wearing overalls as the daily uniform, uh, like my like my grandparents did, and uh, and that generation's gone. But uh, but all of us, if we if we live long enough, we see those those generational changes that seem to be sort of fundamental changes in the place wherever it is that we live. They may or may not be fundamental changes, but that's part of it's what life is about. It's, it's about this constant evolution. We change as a people, and the world around us changes as a result of that. And so that's part of uh, what uh, intrigued me about this, uh, this three-part series on the Ozarks. But we're talking about mostly the modern Ozarks, mostly the 20th century and 21st century Ozarks. And... I'm especially interested in the thing that really led me to study the Ozarks many years ago, uh, back more than 30 years ago when I first started doing this. I was an undergraduate at what we know as Lyon College today, and I remember poking around in the, in the stacks. We had, this, we had this special regional studies room on the, on the top floor of the library there. And it's not a big library. It's smaller than this library. It's a small college, uh, just five or 600 students. And we had this one regional uh, room that we called the Seidenstricker Room. And in that room, I remember coming across a book called The Ozarks Land and Life by Milt Rafferty. And some of you have probably seen that. It was originally published back about 1980 or so and republished a few years ago by the University of Arkansas Press. And I got to looking through that book and I looked at a map of the Ozarks and, and uh, by dog, if, if I wasn't from the Ozarks. And I didn't even really... It had never really dawned on me before. I knew we were hill people. I just didn't know we had a brand associated with us, but we did. And, uh, and it was sort of that moment when I realized, you know, the Ozarks is not just Springfield. You know, we watched Springfield TV when I was growing up in North Central Arkansas, and they were always talking about Ozarks this and Ozarks that. And I thought, well, the Ozarks must be in Springfield. That sounds like a... Sounds like a great place to visit. And then you visit, visit Springfield and you think, where are the Ozarks? This is not, this is flatter than a flitter uh, up here. And, uh, and, you know, you're sort of on top of the Ozarks when you get to Springfield. There's not a lot of, not a lot of undulation up there. And I grew up just across the, the river, across White River from uh, Mountain View, Arkansas. And everything was always Ozark this and Ozark that, the Ozark Folk Center and and all, Jimmy Driftwood was over there and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, that must be where the Ozarks is too. But the Ozarks is a, is a, it's a big place. It's about the size of the state of New York, roughly the size of the nation of Hungary, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the size of, of Hungary. <laughs> I had to look that one up. I had no idea. But, uh, uh, but it's, a, it's a big place, and it has uh, many stories to tell. But one of the things that we know about the Ozarks is that for more than 100 years, there have been definite stereotypes about the people of the Ozarks, and we've, we've lived with those stereotypes. Sometimes we've embraced them. Branson, Missouri is a good example of that. Most of us are old enough to remember when Branson was hillbilly Branson, when that was their thing, that was their shtick, uh, playing up the hillbilly thing and all their hillbilly music shows. It's a very different Branson nowadays. It's sort of Johnny Morris uh, Branson and golf courses and all that kind of stuff. It's, but that's just one of the many things that changes over time. And, it, and the tourism industry changes to react to what people are, are looking for. But we know that that hillbilly stereotype, that hillbilly stereotype that created Branson and sort of made that, that tourism mecca there is something that we've uh, had for a long time. And a lot of that dates from the very early 20th century and the publishing of that book up there, The Shepherd of the Hills. Some of you have probably read The Shepherd of the Hills. Some of you have probably been to the theater show up there outside of Branson, The Shepherd of the Hills, which they're still doing to this day. One of my students is in that show, and I think Fiddle's in the show. And this was a book that was first published in 1907, 
And in many ways, it sort, of, it sort of defined the Ozarks for the American public, for the reading public. And from that point on, even the novels that were written about the Ozarks were kind of copycats of Harold Bell Wright. And a lot of what people thought they knew about the Ozarks came from fiction. It was sort of hillbilly fiction. And uh, if, you, if you read volume three, uh, you'll see my take on Harold Bell Wright and, and his, uh, his view of the Ozarks. Uh, I don't think he was terribly keen on us as, as Ozarks people. Uh, but that became sort of the, uh, the idea of the Ozarks. In social science, they call it a social construct. It's creating an idea of a place and having that idea stick to a place or a people, whether or not it really, it really applies or how much it applies. And so that really takes hold. And then in the 1920s and 1930s, you have people like Vance Randolph, this fellow on the right who spent a lot of time here in Fayetteville. He lived here in Fayetteville for many, many years. Vance Randolph came along. He and other folklorists and people who did travel writing and the Ozarks became extremely popular in the 1920s and 30s and into the 1940s, as we'll see here in a minute. And these people took that, that basic idea of what the Ozarks was, this kind of land of, of hillbillies. And it wasn't necessarily a negative thing for Randolph. This was great. Randolph was a nonconformist. He was a guy who didn't necessarily like sort of the, the capitalist nation that the United States had become. And he was out looking for people who bucked the system and who sort of did their own thing, who were nonconformist like him. And when he came to the Ozarks and found this group of people who were living like it's still the 19th century, he fell in love with the place. And as far as he was concerned, they were doing it on purpose because they were, they were uh, going against the man. If we were calling, I don't know if we were calling it the man back then <laughs> in the early 1900s, but, but they were doing their own thing. Uh, for the most part, they were doing their own thing because they were poor and they didn't have any other options but to do their own thing. But in Randolph's telling, it became sort of the, the motto of Ozarkers. We're backwards because we want to be backwards because that's the way to be. And that was fine for Randolph. He loved that kind of thing. And so Randolph and Otto Ernest Rayburn and a lot of these other writers who were writing about the Ozarks for a national audience in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, are painting these pictures of a rural sort of Arcadian place where you can get away from the mad rush of the world. And a lot of that was true. You could get away from the mad rush of the world. You could get so far away that you probably wanted back in the mad rush of the world <laughs> at some point. But this was, this was a place that they fell in love with. And they kind of, they kind of colored it according to their own, uh, their own wishes, their own philosophies not necessarily uh, what the people of the Ozarks thought or believed or were trying to do. And so by the 1930s, we get this definite idea of what the Ozarks is, a kind of backward place that is unlike the rest of America and where people just are, are different, either in a good way or a bad way, either in a sort of uh, granny in her bonnet, snapping, pea, snapping beans and hoeing peas way, or... Uh, Uncle Jim and his moonshine still way, you know, one of those, one of those ways. There are a lot of different ways it was different. So by the time you get to through the depression, right to the tail end of the depression, there's this kind of continual buildup in the 1930s of, of people writing books and articles and, and TV shows and radio programs, not TV shows, movies and radio programs about the Ozarks. By 1941, we get to what I call the year of the Ozarks. And I've, I've proclaimed that. Nobody else. So don't, yeah, don't go looking for the Wikipedia page on the year of the Ozarks. You won't find it. Uh, or you might find a different year. Maybe somebody's arguing with me out there. But, but I have proclaimed 1941, the year of the Ozarks. And that's because the Ozarks was kind of everywhere in pop culture that year. That's, a, that's really the pinnacle of national interest in the Ozarks. And I got a few of those up there. Some of you may uh, actually recognize that feller there. Uh, nothing to do with the other. That's Roy Rogers, oh. a, a young Roy. Uh, he was in uh, a movie called Arkansas Judge uh, that starred the Weaver Brothers and Elviry. Who's ever heard of the Weaver Brothers and Elviry? 
They were former vaudeville comedians and musicians who became pretty successful B-movie actors in the 1930s and early 40s. Republic Pictures did a whole series of Weaver Brothers and Elviry movies, and the Weaver Brothers were from uh, southwest Missouri. They were Ozarkers uh, from, the, from rural Christian County, Missouri. And in 1941, not one but two of their movies came out. And you could have found those at, at uh, theaters all across, the country. anywhere where they pronounced it theater, you could have seen the Weaver Brothers and Elviry on the screen. Uh, if you were looking for something a little more, well, I won't say sophisticated, but more high budget, then 1941 was also the year that the Technicolor version of The Shepherd of the Hills came out, starring an even more famous cowboy, that guy, John Wayne, was the central character. Now, if you've ever read the novel The Shepherd of the Hills from 1907, and you've seen the 1941 Technicolor movie version of The Shepherd of the Hills, you will know that those are two completely different entities. <laughs> they have nothing in common. This may have been the invention of the phrase uh, Hollywood treatment, uh, because when Hollywood got a hold of Harold Bell Wright's novel, they completely changed it. And it made a lot of people mad, a lot of people who loved Harold Bell Wright's novel, and thousands of people did. That really was the foundation for Branson tourism. It was literary tourism. People were coming to Branson because they wanted to see all these people from the novel that they thought lived there. It'd be sort of like going to Minnesota to see Garrison Keillor's, uh, you know, Norwegian farmers and things like that. We, we probably know better, but some people have probably tried to do that. Back then, they flocked to the Branson area to try to see these people. And so those people were understandably mad in 1941 when Hollywood butchered that novel, but made a lot of money off of that, off of that Technicolor movie. So again, it was just another example of the United States embracing the Ozarks in 1941 and the Ozarks being out in the public's consciousness in 1941. This guy here was an, an Arkansas-er, Bob Burns. It was 1941 when he launched his radio show, his national radio show, The Bob Burns Show. It would eventually be called the Arkansas Traveler. And his show very much played on sort of rural hillbilly humor. And he told uh, stories about his fictional kinfolk back in Crawford County, Arkansas. And Big Wendy's, you might call them. And, and uh, Burns is also the guy who invented this here contraption. Somebody probably knows what that is. The bazooka, yeah, this was uh, 1941, right before a certain war started, and it was the name of his musical instrument, using the term very loosely, musical instrument. If you've ever heard the sound the bazooka made, it's sort of like a dying moose. <laughs> Maybe, uh, well, I've never been around a dying moose, but it can't sound much worse than the sound that that makes. And the army eventually adopted the word bazooka for the weapon that was developed in World War II, uh, the shoulder, you know, mounted uh, launcher uh, sort of thing. And because it looked, not because it sounded like that, but because it kind of looked like that, a long pipe looking thing. And so that became the bazooka. And that's what we've usually associate the term with today. But 1941 is when Bob Burns went on the national airwaves with his radio show talking about relatives back in the Arkansas Ozarks. And 1941 was also the year of this play, one of the most famous plays in World Series history. This is the, that fellers with the Yankees, that fellers with the Dodgers, back when they were the Brooklyn Dodgers, and that feller was from the Ozarks. His name was Mickey Owen. He was the all-star catcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he was from... Christian County, Missouri, just outside of Springfield. And the reason I've got it that up there is because baseball was the national pastime in those days. There was nothing even close to the popularity of baseball. And in the fourth game of the World Series in October of 1941, the Yankees, who were like the Yankees are today, you, if you're not a Yankees fan, you hate the Yankees, right? Well, that same way in 1941, uh, this was after Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and all that kind of stuff. So they had already won many, many World Series. The Brooklyn Dodgers had never won a World Series at that time. 
And the Yankees had them get down two games to one in the fourth game of the World Series, but the Dodgers were up four to three going into the ninth inning, and they were in Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. And two outs, nobody on base, top of the ninth. All you got to do is get that last feller out. You sort of know where this is going with this kind of buildup. <laughs> I wouldn't be talking about it if they just struck him out and the game was over, right? But a full count on Tommy Hendrick, a really good player for the Yankees. And he swings and misses at what should have been the third strike. And it was the third strike. But if you know your baseball, if you know the catcher doesn't catch it, and it gets away from him, then the runner can run down to first base if there's nobody on there. And nobody was on, and so Hendrick looked behind him. Here went the ball squirting off back toward the backstop. Mickey Owen had missed it, the guy from the Ozarks. And everybody, for some reason, everybody in Brooklyn knew he was from the Ozarks. <laughs> and it was at that moment that the year of the Ozarks really came to an end. But Mickey Owen missed that ball. It squirted, squirted past him. Henrik was safe on first. Joe DiMaggio came up, got a single. Then Charlie Keller came up and doubled them both home. He hit one off the wall, and the Yankees took the lead. They added two more insurance runs. They won the game 7-4, to got all the momentum. They went up three games to one in the series, and what do you think happens? They win game five, and they win the World Series. It's going to be 14 more years before the Brooklyn Dodgers win their first World Series. And by that time... Uh, they've got a guy named Jackie Robinson uh, playing for them. So this was, at the time, it was one of the most, it was, still is, one of the, mo the most famous World Series blunders or plays in history. And the folks of Brooklyn turned their backs on the Ozarks forever <laughs> because, of, because of Mickey Owen. But uh, it wasn't all bad. Mickey Owen... Uh, made the all-star team uh, the next three years. He was one of the best. The, the irony of it is he was possibly the best defensive catcher uh, of his generation. He just, uh, he just missed that one. And he admitted he missed it, got away from him, and cost him the game. He would later redeem himself by founding the Mickey Owen Baseball School on Route 66, just about 25 miles west of Springfield, out in a rural area. And... Back in the 1990s, when a feller named Michael Jordan decided he was through with basketball, but he wanted to play baseball, where do you think he went to learn baseball? The Mickey Owen Baseball School in southwest Missouri in the Ozarks. So uh, I guess you could say uh, Mickey you know, redeemed himself somewhat, even though uh, that's a stretch because uh, Michael Jordan was not a very good baseball player. <laughs> but... Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, uh, he, he at least trained in the Ozarks, so we got that connection with him. But, so 1941 is, was really, in many ways, the year of the Ozarks, and in a lot of other ways it was, too. It was 1941 with, when a trio of books about the Ozarks came out from national publishers. And so not only was the Ozarks in the national consciousness and pop culture, but it was also being written about by lots of different people. You had Marguerite Lyon, who was a columnist with the Chicago newspaper, who compiled a bunch of her Marge of Sunrise Mountain Farm articles into a book called Take to the Hills. And it was about, she was a, she was kind of a, sort of a back to the lander, not really what we think of uh, as back to the landers. They probably weren't roughing it a whole lot, but uh, she and her husband bought a little farm in Southern Missouri and she would go down there on weekends and spend the week in Chicago, and he would stay down there and uh, cut wood or you know, do whatever you do, you know, herd goats or something. I don't know what, what he was doing. But she would write colorful stories about their neighbors back in the Ozarks, and that's the basis of, of uh, Take to the Hills. And Yesterday Today was a book uh, written by a woman named Catherine Barker, who was a social worker in the 1930s. And hers was not a, not a romantic view of the Ozarks. Hers was more a view of the backwoods Ozarks that most people didn't know about, but she did because she was a social, a social worker and she spent a lot of time out there trying to help people who were really destitute. And she had seen a completely different side of the Ozarks than Vance Randolph and Otto Rayburn and Marge Lyon ever wrote about. And that's what Yesterday Today was about. 
But the last one to come out was Otto Ernest Rayburn's Ozark Country. That was the most popular, published in New York. And it came out right around the 1st of December in 1941. And it would go through uh, several different uh, printings uh, over the years. And it's still, we just brought it back into print. The University of Arkansas Press, uh, I guess it was last year. Uh, so it's, it's still around. But this one was a very romantic view of the Ozarks, kind of that sort of that uh, uh, kind of good hillbilly Arcadia backcountry view of the Ozarks. Rayburn had fallen in love with the Ozarks, and he didn't care who knew it. He wanted to tell the world about it. The only problem for him was just about five or six days after his book came out, this happened. Pearl Harbor happened, and that was the end of the year of the Ozarks. If Mickey Owen didn't bring an end to it with his blunder behind the plate in Game 4 of the World Series, certainly the Japanese brought an end to it by focusing the country's attention on other matters. We were no longer concerned about regional eccentricities and strange people in the backwoods and moonshiners and all that kind of stuff. The focus became winning the war and that ended sort of the pinnacle of Ozark's popularity. But not to worry just yet, for that very year, 1941, the year of the Ozarks was the year of birth of one of my favorite Ozarks characters, a feller by the name of Junior Cobb. Junior grew up in the White River Valley over south of Mountain Home in that area. And his family was, uh, was quite poor. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know this at when, uh, until I was almost finished with the book. In uh, the chapter on the Great Depression in my book, I, I lead off that chapter with a story, with a story of two different families, but one of the families is a family by the name of Acklin from north central Arkansas, who were destitute and traveled around just trying to try not to die, which is what a lot of people were doing in the Depression, just trying not to die. And that family was actually related to Old Jr. They were his uncle and aunt. And I didn't even know that until I had written both of them, the Acklins and Jr., into the into the book, and I, I discovered it on Find a Grave. Some of you use Find a Grave, and it's amazing all the kind of stuff you can, you can track down on, on Find a Grave. But there they were, the Acklins and Junior. But Junior was born in 1941, the year of the Ozarks, which seems, seems like it should be significant. I don't know if Junior ever knew that was the year of the Ozarks, but he knew that was the year he was born. And he grew up basically uneducated. I'm not sure that he could even read and write, but he was a tremendous artist. He was a great woodcarver and became known in the 60s and 70s for his mastery as a woodcarver. He became nationally known. His, his work was exhibited in the Smithsonian. He was on national TV. He was on the Glen Campbell Variety Show, and you had made it if you were on the Glen Campbell Variety Show. <laughs> I don't care what you say. That sounds good to me. And that was a junior cop, but he, was, he became something of kind of a symbol of the Ozarks in the 1960s. We know the 1960s was a period of the folk revival, and people were interested in the old days again. That's part of the reason why every other show uh, between 1955 and 65 was a Western on TV. We were interested in the old days and, and just kind of obsessed with that. And that was part of that, that folk revival movement. As part of that, we were fascinated with people who seemed to live like it was still in the old days. And Junior was one of those characters. He lived basically out in the woods and did pretty much what he wanted to do. If he got up that morning and decided he didn't feel like wood carving, he'd go fishing or go hunting or just go do something else, uh, spelunk around in caves or whatever else he could do. And he became kind of a symbol for what the nation still thought about the Ozarks in the 1960s. There were articles written about him. Uh, there were articles supposedly written by him, even though he was, he was probably illiterate. The, uh, the TV Guide had a review that he wrote about the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, that's, uh, you know you're having fun when, when you've got a ghost-written review of the TV show The Beverly Hillbillies by Junior Cobb. <laughs> in a national magazine. The TV Guide was the most popular magazine at, in that day and time, and no telling how many millions of people read Junior's review of 
uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. And he thought it was pretty good. He didn't have a TV, but somebody took him to a TV so he could watch an episode, and he was impressed. He, in my estimation, he would have been even more impressed by the Andy Griffith Show, but I don't know that anybody ever showed him an episode of the Andy Griffith Show. Uh, that just would have ruined him for, for the Beverly Hillbillies. But that was Junior Cobb. He became a symbol uh, decades after the year of the Ozarks, of this kind of old-timey place of friendly hillbillies. That's what he was. He was just kind of the personification of a friendly, carefree hillbilly who didn't really, when he got up in the morning, didn't really know where his meal was going to come from, and he wasn't all that concerned about it. As long as there were squirrels in the trees, he was going to eat something. And that was... Uh, that was Junior Cobb. Now, there was another side to Junior Cobb, too, that, that didn't always make it into these pictures and into the articles about him, and that was that Junior Cobb, for most of his life, lived in poverty, and he would die in abject poverty. Uh, and I don't know that he, that he minded it all that much, but that's, that was the outcome. He lived in poverty. He eventually ended up uh, on his own, uh, uh, divorced, uh, possibly because one of the articles stated that the only time he carved was when his wife made him. And she may have got tired of making him uh, do his, his wood carvings. Uh, but behind that beautiful artistry uh, was a guy who r really struggled and lived in poverty like many people in the Ozarks did. Behind that, that exterior, that veneer of happy hillbillies was a story that sometimes was like the story that Catherine Barker was telling in 1941. It was a, it was a story of poverty and sometimes even destitution, a story that people weren't as comfortable with as they were talking about uh, the happy hillbilly Junior Cobb. So even into the 1960s and 70s and even the 80s and 90s, I would say, this was still very much the image that the nation had associated with the Ozarks. It was kind of that hillbilly image. It could be a positive Im image, it could be a happy, uh, carefree, nonconformist hillbilly image, and it could be a negative image at well, as well. But that was kind of the image. But I think we have seen, you know, just like we saw the, the overall generation disappear, we've seen that image change really remarkably, radically, just in this century. In 2011, Junior Cobb died at the age of 70. He lived a full generation, if you take your generations in the biblical generation sort of, sort of way. He lived 70 years, and it was also that year that uh, just, uh, just about a month before he died in late 2011, Something happened that has been really central to helping change the image of the Ozarks in the last decade or so. And somebody probably knows what that was. Remember what happened on 11 11 11? Yeah. Yeah. This happened on 11 11 11 Crystal Bridges just about a month before Junior passed on, as we say. And maybe that's what did him in. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he saw all that fancy. Uh, modern art and, and uh, American art by, the, by the, the trained artist over there, and it just, it just finished him off. I don't know. I, I would like to think that at some point Crystal Bridges uh, will have Junior Cobb in their, in their museum. His work, not him himself. He, that would not, yeah. That, though I'm sure that in some places that is considered artwork uh, today. But I would like to think that, that Junior will be remembered at some point as a, as a terrific vernacular artist. That's what we generally call artists who aren't formally trained, no matter how good they are. They're vernacular artists, especially if they can't read and write. And, uh, but but this, was a, this was a different thing. I kept up with this uh, in the years leading up to the opening of uh, Crystal Bridges. And at first... The nation's take on this was, uh, was kind of a negative one. Some of you may remember this, too, when stories about Alice Walton and, and Crystal Bridges appeared in national magazines or newspapers. It was by angry New Yorkers and people from the West Coast, too, who were mad about all this art being robbed from Philadelphia and New York and the places where it should be and brought to the middle of the country in a place where 
the implication was it shouldn't be. What do they need with art? And, and sometimes it was amazing how uh, you know, the, the sort of tin ear that, that some of these uh, writers had, they didn't really realize how condescending they were, they were being uh, by just assuming that why in the world would you have a world-class art museum in a place like Arkansas, in a place like the Ozarks? I mean, who, who, could, who could fathom such a thing? By the time it opens in 2011, what you see is people had been converted. Uh, the Waltons have a way of doing that, just, just turning people around somehow and convincing them that whatever they've been doing sounds good to us. And that's what happens. In the decade or so since Crystal Bridge is open, I've kept up with national stories about the Ozarks. And there has been really a, a sea change. There's, there have been stories that I never would have expected to read about the Ozarks. And it's almost as if there was a conscious rebranding campaign going on somewhere in Bentonville or Northwest Arkansas in general. And it's, and it's had its effects. Uh, and they've, they've sort of worked in some ways. Not everybody was convinced, though. Uh, it was the very next year, in 2012, when the, uh, the World Championship Squirrel cook-off uh, was, that was, that was sort of, uh, I, I guess there's kind of a yin and yang quality to that. There's kind of a uh, balancing of the force in some way. Uh, it, was, it was maybe inevitable that something was going to happen to sort of, you know, br to kind of bring Crystal Bridges down a little bit. But that happened in Bentonville, I've never been to that, but, uh, but it, it sounds like something that uh, it, it just needed to be, right? It just need, it needed to exist uh, in this world where Crystal Bridges is, exist. But I don't think that uh, there's been some national coverage of that, too, because it's, it's a fun, kind of funny, well, these, these, uh, there may still be some hillbillies around these parts after all, which is what I guess Joe Wilson was, was trying to remind people of. But I think the main story, though, has been a, a rebranding of the Ozarks in many ways. This is uh, the cover of Vogue in June of 1917. And I never in a million years would have, uh, would have expected to read the title of an article in Vogue mag magazine that said, Why You Should Visit the Ozarks. Who in the world would expect Vogue magazine to tell anybody to visit the Ozarks? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. And at, at that moment, I could just kind of feel the earth shuddering. And I was convinced that it was Vance Randolph and Otto Rayburn and the Queen of the Hillbillies, May Kennedy McCord, all rolling over in their graves at the same time that this, that this had become the image of the Ozarks because when Vogue magazine was writing about the Ozarks, it wasn't about people in overalls. It wasn't an old guy holding a pair of mules by the reins. It wasn't any of that kind of usual stuff that we had seen for generations in our coverage of the Ozarks. It was about Crystal Bridges, and it was about this, uh, this high south cuisine that was developing in northwest Arkansas, and it was about places that were perfect for taking a selfie in a bathroom <laughs> in a trendy hotel somewhere. And it was about French pastry shops and all this kind of stuff. It was about stuff that didn't exist in the Ozarks all that long ago. And even if it did, you never heard about it because no one ever wrote about it. Because when you thought about the Ozarks, you thought about something very different. You thought about sort of an, uh, a hillbilly Ozarks. But this is what, we're, this is what we've got now. This image is not going to completely overtake that older image. Uh, we've still got things like, you know, the Ozark Netflix uh, TV show, uh, which has put, but the, though there are very few natives on, on that show, and uh, most of them don't fare all that well, not to give anything away, but uh, I, 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 I like the show. Uh, but this is, uh, this is sort of a new, this is an era when I think we've got kind of those dueling images. We've got the old ones uh, sort of being pushed out a little bit by national coverage of all this new stuff that I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You, I, uh, you live here in Northwest Arkansas. I don't. And uh, what I do know is 
I don't recognize the place usually when I come back because I don't come here all that often. And it just seems like every time I come here, there's 50,000 new people here that weren't here the last time I was here. And, and, and you know, that many track houses and, and things like that. It's a, it's a booming place, one of the nation's really, really booming places. And it's a place that has experienced more than just kind of this cultural veneer sort of change with, with high-class art museums and high South cuisine and all this kind of stuff. It's a place that has experienced tremendous demographic changes in the last 30 years. And that uh, may be even more a, a fundamentally you know, significant part of the story of the Ozarks. And uh, we know that now there are, uh, there are several school districts, large school districts in Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, that are, uh, that are uh, majority non-white students. And that's a big change. You know, you go back to uh, when I was, uh, I talked about this in the last, in the, I don't, I don't remember if I call it the last chapter of the epilogue or something like that of the book. I went back and looked at the statistics from the late 80s to the, to the modern day. And it's just a tremendous demographic change uh, that we've seen. A lot of it has been fueled by the poultry industry. Again, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know here. Uh, and a lot of it's been fueled by Walmart bringing in people from around the world, around the nation, and really changing the demographics. So, so there, are, uh, there are significant changes to the Ozarks that, that force us to kind of, kind of refashion an image of the Ozarks. And I think we're just kind of in the middle of that now. I don't really know where this is, where this is going to go. What I do know is, though, that there's still not just one Ozarks. And one of the things that Crystal Bridges and Walt Money uh, cannot do is change a lot of these generational issues that we have in the Ozarks. Uh, there are still large swaths of the Ozarks where the story is still very similar to what the story has been for generations. And that is a story of poverty and a lack of opportunity. It's a story that is very different than the story that you get here in Northwest Arkansas. And when you look at the Ozarks in total, in many ways, it's a story of a, of a very depressed rural place in a, a depressed rural America. Much of rural America, unfortunately, uh, looks like this. Uh, with little oases of prosperity and affluence kind of scattered around it. And what history tells us, and what I talked about in the earlier volumes of this series, is that the places that have, that have always been relatively prosperous in the Ozarks are the places that are still affluent to this day. Northwest Arkansas has, has always been, you know, compared to our, the rest of Arkansas and compared to the rest of the Ozarks, it's always been a pretty prosperous place. The Springfield, Missouri area has always been a pretty prosperous place compared to the rest of the Ozarks. And these places continue to thrive and do well today. And if anything, we see a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots in the Ozarks. And that's kind of a geographic gap, the have areas and the have-not areas. Uh, I happen to, uh, to be from one of those have-not areas, and it's a very, it's a very different experience. Uh, to, uh, it's an interesting experience to uh, keep one foot in, in a poor county uh, with one stoplight in the county, and we really don't need that one. It's just there, I, th <laughs> I think. So we won't look as much like Hicks as we, as we really are. I'm pretty sure one stoplight just makes you look even worse. Uh, especially when you don't need it. But when I go from, from that to Springfield, the largest city in the Ozarks, and a, and a pretty, uh, pretty prosperous uh, place, not, not quite on the level of, of uh, Benton County or, or anything like that, it's a, it's a, it's a, a jarring change in the, in the range of opportunities or the lack of opportunity that you have in one place and the opportunities you have in another place. And so we'd, we still have, as we've had for generations, we have the movement of population from places lacking opportunity to those that, that promise opportunity. And there's no reason to think that's going to change anytime soon. As I said, if anything, it's just going to become more stark. And we're going to have an Ozarks that is uh, where you have a, an increasingly poor 
you know, rural kind of center to the region and these little oases of prosperity. And you can see these dark counties, most of you are probably too far away to really read the details of the map. Uh, but the darker the county, the poorer uh, it is in, in the modern day. And so you have a big block of, of really of, of a, you know, a poor Ozarks that, uh, that shows no signs of ever you know, coming out of that, especially in the post-manufacturing era when a lot of those places had a, had a brief moment of time when there were, when there were shoe factories and, and little manufacturing outfits here and there, and those, uh, those aren't around anymore. So, so to me, the, the, the story of the Ozarks is, is the story of history in general. We're, just, we're somewhere in the middle of this story. We just don't know, we just don't know where it's going. Uh, historians can tell you where we've been and maybe a little bit about what it means, but we know it's always changing and we know it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep changing. And, you know, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, it's going to be a very different place. I don't know what it's going to be, but, but I think, you know, we're, we're going to stay in this, in this kind of holding pattern of the haves and the have-nots in the Ozarks, which is where we've been you know, for, for many, many generations. That's the story of the Ozarks. There's a lot more in the book uh, than this, and, uh, uh, but it is something to think about. It's, it's the, uh, the, the continuation of, of certain, certain things that we know to be part of the Ozark story, even as the Ozarks image on the national level uh, continues to change. So, and with that, I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions you have, any, uh, any disagreements you have with me. First, I want to say I appreciate you coming down and talking to us. It's been great to listen to you. Uh, could you comment a little bit on the impact of the great dams on the White River mm -hmm. on, on Ozark Prosperity? Yeah. And I was also curious if you've ever heard of an author named Tiny Page. Oh, yeah. His book called The Voices of Moccasin Creek. Sure. I love that book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, about the dams, yeah, the, uh, one of the, and I talk uh, quite a bit about this in the, in the book, one of the big stories of the middle of the 20th century was the dam building frenzy, that, especially the, the one undertaken by the Army Corps of Engineers, which uh, begins in the, in the late 1930s and continues into the late 1970s in the Ozarks. Uh, so it's about a 40-year story, and it really it remakes the map of much of the Ozarks. Uh, you, you know, you have to have a different map. You can't use the old pre-1930s map because we've got a lot of man-made reservoirs out there. And to your point, in a, in a lot of those places, you do see the coming of prosperity. Now, when the dams first started being built, uh, usually the, the, the official talk was that it's about uh, flood control which is, again, it's not flood control for people in the Ozarks, it's flood control for people way downstream summers, right? Uh, because you're fixing to flood a whole bunch of country to keep other people from, from flooding out. Uh, so it's about, it's about flood control, and sometimes it's about uh, hydroelectricity generation, although the, you know, today the percentage of our electricity that we get from hydro is you know, just really, really uh, minimal. And, but what, what we often, you know, overlook in that story is the, you know, the, the, the environmental impact of those dams and the, the changes that have been made to, uh, to uh, water ecology and fish populations and, and things like that. That's why uh, today, you know, there are certain places in the Ozarks that advertise themselves as the you know trout fishing meccas and there are places where trout fishermen from all over the country come to the ozarks but almost all of our trout are stocked trout and they're stocked because those cold damn waters that water you know coming from the bottom of that that lake out those uh, turbines uh, is uh, not compatible with our traditional warm water water fish and so you replace those with stocked trout some of the trout do uh, re uh, you know, procreate and reproduce themselves in there, but, uh, but 
we, that's why we have all those trout hatcheries. Uh, most of them don't, and we put those in there. So that's been a, that's been a major, it's been a major change uh, that we have. But a lot of those places have experienced great prosperity, prosperity for some. Uh, and, you know, you talk about Twin Lakes region, Bull Shoals, North Fork Lake, Round Mountain Home. Mountain Home blossomed in the 1950s. After Bull Shoals got built, North Fork had already been built during the war, and that place just exploded. And, uh, and, and you have similar stories in other places. Not all of the man-made reservoirs saw that kind of uh, success story in terms of tourism. Uh, some of them uh, did not. Uh, Truman Lake up in Missouri was considered by many of the local folks up there a bust uh, because they didn't see that big that big boost in, in tourism and development that they expected to see. And some of that may have just had to do with, it was kind of a, it was kind of an ugly looking lake, you know, and you know, that just, it, it, it shouldn't have been, you know, dammed up in the first place. And, uh, and, you know, some people would say none of them should have, should have been dammed up, but that's uh, it's why it's what we do. You know, and there are going to be those of us who champion, dam building for whatever reason and those of us who oppose it for whatever reason and it just so happened in the, the middle part of the 20th century it was a time when the consensus was this is a good idea and politicians on both sides of the aisles were often for that especially when it brought pork barrel pork barrel spending dollars to your state to, to your district uh, that was a hard thing to to stand up against and uh and so we got a lot of those built, but it's a, it's been a, it's been a major, major change. And I just, I just said more about that than I wrote about it in the book. And I, so you don't even have to read that part of the book. <laughs> you are excused. You can just skip over that. There's probably some subheading in there that'll tell you when you get to that part. If you had a visitor from, from where, I'm not here, and they had one day and they said, show me the Ozarks, where would you take them? Well, that's a good question. Uh, wow. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. I, I, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about that, I'm going to be talking about something different. Uh, I, re, I remember, I remember uh, a, a, a good friend of mine and a mentor of mine, uh, Bill McNeil, W.K. McNeil, who was a longtime folklorist at the Ozark Folk Center in Mountain View. He used to always say, that uh, if, there's a, if there's a sort of classic town in the Ozarks that has not been overly affected by tourism, uh, that hasn't, you know, it kind of clowned itself out like Branson, uh, that hasn't, uh, that is still, you know, kind of in the heart of the Ozarks, but it's sort of what you would expect if there was no tourism industry and there was no... Uh, 20th century man-made lake, you know, industry. This is the this is the place that you would look to as what kind of the typical Ozark town would be. And he always said that was Harrison, Arkansas. That was uh, that it was a place that you know wasn't wasn't affected. And uh, so I I'm, I'm not saying that I would take them uh, to Harrison. I'm also uh, uh, not saying that I wouldn't take them to Harrison. I think where, where I would, where I would uh, take someone, if I just had one day. Jasper. No, no, not Jasper. That's uh, no. Gainesville, Missouri is really is really close. Yeah. Well, I'd probably let them skip. I'd probably let them skip Hooten and Howard, but, but uh, they, uh, uh, but Gainesville is really close. But just above Gainesville is Douglas County, Missouri. And maybe my favorite place in the Ozarks is this out-of-the-way little uh, community called Champion, Missouri. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Champion, Missouri. Uh, you would remember it if you've ever been to Champion, Missouri. There's almost nothing in Champion except a Church of Christ and a little country store. It's at the end, it's at the end of a blacktop road, and then you just got miles of, of gravel road past it. It's a little creek bottom. Nice little grove of trees and, and that kind of stuff. And that's probably, it's even, uh, it, was, it was magical the first time I visited it because the old store was still there that had been built in the 1920s. 
it's, it's more, almost more authentic today because of what happened to that old store. Uh, this old store was, was owned by a woman. Or it's, it is owned by a woman named Betty Henson. It's the, it's the Henson's Grocery and Gas. And uh, I visited, I first visited that store in 2009. It was this old, just kind of almost fallen over, just old wooden store built in the, in the 1920s. Just had the stovepipe snaking out the back wall, had, a, had the pot-bellied stove in the middle of it. Just, you know, everything you think of in an old country store. The next time I came back, it was gone. Betty had, had torn it down and built a new store. And to me, that's, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I hated to see the old store go, but the fact that she was still trying to make a living and still and realized that you know, this would be a lot better with a store that probably is not going to fall on my head one of these days. And that's what she said. She said one of, one of these days somebody, somebody was going to drive up to the store and it wouldn't be there. And they would say, where's Betty? And she'd be under it. <laughs> but she replaced that store with kind of a new version that looks a whole lot like the other store. And it's built right in the same place of the other store. And I, when I first visited that, I, it, what it brought to mind was, uh, if you remember the old Steve Martin movie, The Jerk. And at the end of The Jerk, you know, his, his family tears down their sharecropper shack and they just build like a giant shack right where it was. It looks, it's, it's just, it's new. It's a new version of the old shack they had. And that's kind of what Betty, she just built like a, a new version of the old store. And to me, that was just a very Ozarky thing to do. Uh, even if it took all the kind of the romance away from that old store. Uh, so we'd, we'd take a trip to Champion, I'm pretty sure, and probably go through Gainesville on the way. Uh, I love Jasper, but eh, J- Jasper's, Jasper has been uh, affected by uh, the, the knowledge of good and evil in, in many ways. It has, uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, newcomers to Jasper who've really changed the place. And uh, one of these days, it may even start to be gentrified in some way. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? But, I, but uh, Gainesville's not there yet. Gainesville's a pretty pretty good example. I worked in the Harrison Social Security office from late 76 to mid 87. And I dealt with a lot of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I, I ran into people that were still living in the log cabins with dirt floors. Ran into people who didn't know how to use indoor toilets or dial a telephone. Yeah. It was, just, uh, it was kind of a culture shock for me. Yeah. But I, yeah. Would re- I would have recommended Marshall as a good place to go. Marshall, to yeah, Marshall. Marshall. I, th- I think Marshall would be probably today would be a better place than uh, than Harrison. And uh, I don't know what what our, our current our resident Marshall Marshallite thinks about that. But uh, that that's that's a pretty good it's a pretty good thing. And you've even got uh, you've even got the new uh, county jail museum there. You can you can visit. So next time you go to Marshall, visit. I have a question about your map. Uh huh. So uh, I see the line, the boundary between mm-hmm. Arkansas and Missouri, uh-huh. and I understand the delta over here. But what constitutes the Ozarks for you on this map? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good question. It's one of the things that I that I've struggled with throughout this process, and that I've always struggled with in thirty something years of, of research and writing about the Ozarks. What we've got here, this this uh. This dotted line is the geographer's definition of the Ozarks. So that is your, that's the physical Ozarks. That's a place where uh, geographers would say everything within those boundaries is similar enough to each other and different enough from what's outside of those boundaries. That that's, that's what we can say the physical Ozarks is. Now, that's a very different thing than saying where the cultural Ozarks is. As a historian, that's what I'm more concerned about. And I write a little bit about this uh, in, in the beginning of this book. One of, my, one of the things that I, that I was going to do, and I didn't do it, uh, but that I, was, that I was just bound and determined I was going to do for this third volume is I was going to come up with a cultural map of the Ozarks. We've got a physical map of the Ozarks. So, so where is the cultural Ozarks? Where is it where... And there's different ways of defining that. One way is to say just where is it that people live 
And people say, yeah, I'm in the Ozarks. And where do they say, no, I'm not in the Ozarks? That's one way to define the cultural Ozarks. It may be the easiest way to define it. Any other way is probably more arbitrary than that. And so what I was going to do was, uh, was going to... I was going to draw a map of the cultural Ozarks, uh, the boundaries, but basically using that definition. Where do people think they're in the Ozarks? And I spent years traveling around the region. And a lot of times when I was in these uh, kind of marginal places that are inside the geographer's Ozarks, but eh, I didn't know if they were in the cultural Ozarks or not, I would stop and I'd just ask people. I'd go in the library or go in a convenience store or something like that. And I'd say, am I in the Ozarks? And sometimes I just get a really weird look, like, uh, "Well, you're, uh, you're really lost, aren't you?" If you th- <laughs> sometimes, sometimes people would say yes, sometimes no. Sometimes different people in the same place would say yes and no. You know, just depending on, on who you ask. And so it was it was a complex enough thing that I finished the writing of the book before I really had you know had a had a had a notion of where, I, I've got in my own mind sort of where the, uh, the cultural Ozarks is. And to, to answer your question, that was your question, right? To answer your question, what I would do for the cultural Ozarks, and I, again, I don't have the map to do this, but you can pretty much shave off uh, that area. most of that. You can sh- most of the Missouri Valley and the Mississippi Valley you know, within 10 or 20 miles of those rivers, you can shave off uh, because people in those places don't identify with the Ozarks. Geographers will tell them they're in the Ozarks and then they'll have a fist fight because they don't want to be in the Ozarks with the rest of us. You can also come down here south of that same boundary line of the Ozarks and you can add territory because there are plenty of people who live south of this line down here in places like Van Buren and Cleburne and Crawford and Franklin and Johnson who will tell you that they do live in the Ozarks. And so a lot of it's just, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a matter of identity. It's what people identify with, and it's not necessarily what the geographers tell us. A lot of these people up here are of German descent, and their ancestors came to Missouri in the middle of the 19th century. And from the very beginning, they were sort of middle class, often educated people of uh, Germans who didn't really want to have anything to do with the riffraff who lived in the Ozarks, the real Ozarkers. And a lot of that, a lot of that has carried through for generations to the point where they don't really associate with the region. You go to those places, there are beautiful rolling hill country places up along the Missouri River, just absolutely stunning places. And you drive through there and you know you're in the Ozarks, you're in the physical Ozarks. But you start looking at the towns and sort of the, uh, the markers of German heritage in those towns, and you realize that, that a lot of those, the descendants of those people don't identify with the Ozarks, then who are we to force them into Ozarkness? Uh, we'll just let them be whatever they want to be. They, we all have different, we all have kind of a hierarchy of identities and uh, and th- you run into the same thing over in the Oklahoma Ozarks. A lot of people in the Oklahoma Ozarks, their, their top identity is their Native American identity. Uh, they may still identify as Ozarkers somewhere down the list, but it's, it's probably not going to be near the top. And you, you're probably only going to find those people who have it right at the top who are kind of in these epicenters of uh, Ozarkness, places like Newton County. In places like Ozark County, those are the places where you're more likely to find people who really, really strongly identify with the Ozarks. What I, what I heard over there was not the southern accent or not the mid, Midwest accent. What I heard over there was a Scots Irish dialect. But very much so out of Searcy County and uh, Marion County and Newton County and even Boone County, which was being prosperous county at that time. There's a, yeah, there's something to be said for that. Yeah, I don't. Uh, that's a that's a whole that's a whole can of worms to, to open up when you talk, start talking about Scots Irishness. But that's a I think I think she had her hand up. and Then I'll get to you. Growing up in Iowa, what defined what the Ozarks were to me was Little Abner, and you didn't. Oh, right. Yeah. right. So again, Newton County, a good place for that. Uh, yeah, again, that's uh, for people who who weren't from the Ozarks, and even some people who were. 
It was those more stereotypical images of the Ozarks. And the truth of the matter is that uh, for most of the run of Al Cap's Little Abner, and those of you who uh, are too young, and most of us aren't too young to remember, but those of you who are too young to remember, that was a long-running comic strip uh, that ran from the 30s into, I, I think it went out of business in 77, uh, that uh, he was never really geographically specific where that was. It, it was just sort of hillbilly land. It could be Appalachia, it could be the Ozarks. Once Dogpatch USA got built in 68 in Newton County, then it became sort of, well, this must be the Ozarks. But, uh, but that, was, that was really a, a, that was a very prominent image uh, for people around the country. Several years ago, I went to a National Folk uh, reunion in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and we got a tour, bus tour of the area. And some of the area was very nicely farmed and beautiful and everything else. And then you go into another area and there's old new, old refrigerators on the front porch and things of that. And it was explained to us that the fancy, the well-farmed places, that's where all the German settlers came. And the ones with the, with the shacks, those were the, where the Scots-Irish lived. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, Russell Gerlach must have been leading your uh, group tour. He was a, he was a, 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 a longtime geographer at, at uh, Missouri State University. Uh, what, what amazes me about a lot, and, there, and you're exactly, uh, I, don't, I won't say you're exactly right, your, your story is, is very uh, accurate to me in that that has long been the narrative uh, presented by geographers that, you know, Germans superior, Scots-Irish inferior, which, which seems, seems odd that we would, we would embrace that after World War II. Uh, you know, what, what are we thinking? But uh, I, I, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's very much an oversimplification and what always struck me is that almost all the geographers who, who put that argument forward had German surnames. <laughs> and uh, what, what, you, what you find is that there are, regardless of the ethnic group, there were, there were middle class, uh, you know, progressive farmers, and there were, you know, what we might call hillbillies. And, uh, and the Germans had them too. Uh, it's, uh, and it's just, it's one, again, it's one of those, those narratives that's really become embedded. And I'm not saying that it, that it didn't have some basis. In fact, I'm, uh, what I'm saying is with a lot of the, the things like that, it's just an oversimplification. Uh, we can find plenty of examples of Scots-Irish settlers who were uh, very progressive and very prosperous. Uh, there is an entire community in southeastern Missouri called Caledonia that has been studied extensively that was largely settled by Scots-Irish immigrants and their, uh, their descendants. And it was kind of a beacon of prosperity for, for that area. And, and, and don't forget that the Scots-Irish were the great academy and college builders of the American frontier. Uh, the Presbyterians built more colleges and academies than any, any other religious group, and, and the vast majority of those were the Scots-Irish and the descendants of the Scots-Irish. So, uh, so I, I, know, I know that, that, uh, that dichotomy, that, that binary you know, explanation has been out there and has been popular for a long time. Uh, and it's just my job, I guess, to, to, to muddy those waters up a little bit and remind people it's not always that that simple. Yeah. Can you know about um, the conflict and I think the difficulties between National Park Service and all those dark counties in Missouri where they yeah. came in and um, yeah. created the Ozark National Scenic Riverways and I think the current river was one of the rivers in contention to be dammed in the 60s. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, I, I've actually got a uh, my next book that's coming out in December. 
uh, which is called Up South in the Ozarks, has, a, has an essay on uh, rivers and dams and all that kind of stuff. And it's basically about the Buffalo and the Ozark National Scenic Riverways. And uh, that it's, it's actually in the, in the 60s when all that stuff really uh, goes down. But, uh, but you know, we're in, here in Arkansas, we're much more familiar with the story of the Buffalo River and the nationalization of the Buffalo. Well, that same, almost the same exact story played out a decade earlier in Missouri in southeast Missouri with the Ozark National Scenic Riverways when the current river in the Jacks Fork, or at least part of the current river in the Jacks Fork, were nationalized to form the Ozark National Scenic Riverways in 64, uh, eight years before the, the Buffalo National River. And it left a lasting legacy of animosity uh, and from those people whose, whose land was taken away from them. Uh, there were, there were uh, you know, dozens of, of families who, uh, who had their land uh, taken away uh, by eminent domain and, uh, you know, the, that, that kind of a process. And still to this day, there's still some hard feelings uh, in, the, in the Buffalo Valley. Uh, you, I mean, you, you don't necessarily know it uh, by, you know, listening to the 50th anniversary talk. You know, we, we never really dig into the, the other parts of of that story, uh, the people who were displaced by dams or by nationalization of rivers. There's always, you know, there's always something else going on behind that story that, that's worth telling just to get the full story. But in Southeast Missouri, I think it's even to this day, and it's been, it's been nearly 60 years. And uh, about 10 years ago, I went to a meeting in a small town in Southeast Missouri, and it was something to do, it was a it was an uh, initiative by the National Park Service. They weren't taking anybody's land. They weren't going to demand uh, you know, anything from, uh, from anybody, but it, was, but it was the National Park Service involved. And I'll be of that place. It was like a little community center. And that place was filled to the gills with people, and they were angry people. I was, I was there just as an observer and immediately uh, regretted being there because I, you know, I'm a big chicken. And I was, I was looking at, I was, uh, I was searching the various exits and, and figuring out how I was going to get out of this place if things started going badly. It no, it was not far. It was Mountain View. Uh, it would have even been worse if it, well, it would have been worse in eminence probably than, than uh, Van Buren. But, uh, uh, but it, it really got heated there. I mean, there were, uh, and, I, and I talk about this in that essay in my next book. It's the first time I ever saw real-life henchmen. I mean, there were, there were like strong-arm people in there carrying, uh, carrying folks out who disagreed with them. And part of me was excited because I was, you know, I was experiencing part of the world. I never, and, uh, and, but part of me was pretty, uh, pretty amazed, too, that, man, this is, you know, this is 21st century, and, and uh, we're still just, mad as hornets about this thing but but i but i you know i understand that and i talk about in that essay that uh my uh my great great grandparents were displaced by norfolk dam uh they lost they were in their 80s and uh lost their farm and they refused to leave and they carried them carried them out uh and uh so so you know there are still a lot of families in the ozarks generations you know generations uh, removed from those experiences, who remember that? You know, it's it's family, it's part of the family folklore of, by this time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're about to. Are they about to shut us down here at eight? Okay. Yeah. We, we don't want to be locked in the library overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I got one question back there in the corner. in the future there being more backlash related to the sociological changes that this region is going through. Um, I would think the prosperity is well received. I'm, I'm wondering yeah. where that might change. Well, I, I, I think 
I think the issues we're going to deal with are, are they're, you know, they're national issues and, and they're international issues. I mean, we, you know, we haven't scratched the surface yet of dealing with uh, issues of, of uh, sexual identity and, you know, kind of the modern, the modern issues that, that, are, that are going to dominate uh, the, the 21st century. And, and we know that, and I know from, from living in the, in the rural Ozarks, that a lot of these things are, they're, you know, they're hot, they're still really controversial, hot button issues. Uh, you know, we talk about the culture wars for a reason. And, and I know that, I don't think that's exactly what you were asking about, but I think, I think that we've got that uh, to deal with, whether it's in schools or churches or, or wherever it is. And that's not something that the Ozarks has that no one else does. I mean, that's just, that just reinforces the idea that we're very much a part of uh, this USA. And we're not all that different from, from uh, other places. Now, as far as the, the, the growing gulf between the haves and the have-nots, I, uh, I'm not going to be surprised if we see... Well, I think, I think we already, to some degree, see the effects of a sort of populist mentality out there. It's not, it's not the populism of the 1880s and 90s, where uh, it's poor people saying... Uh, let's get rid of these rich people, these railroad companies, these corporations. We don't trust any of them. Uh, it's a different sort of populism that we're seeing now that sometimes uh, race and other issues gets, uh, gets mixed up in. But, but I think at some point we're going to see a little bit of a return of that, of that class-based populism. I don't know how you can't if, if we continue to have uh, a growing gulf between the people who have and the people who don't, and uh, and you see it reflected on a on a map like this, and that's just a reflection of the United States in general. So, uh, I'm particularly concerned about yeah, you mentioned Harrison earlier, yeah. and of course the issues that have been going on there the past decades with the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Right. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a uh, that's that's an issue that uh, that's it's a very complex thing. Uh, probably not the, the one we want to tackle at 7:48, but uh, but I will say uh, that that uh, there are definitely just like with the rest of the country, we definitely have issues of race to work out. In many ways, I think the there have probably been more national articles written about the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan than there are members of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I think, you know, I think that's part of what happens is uh, they're, you know, they're a lightning rod organization and they probably get a lot more publicity than they should, than they merit. It has gone quiet, at least seemingly. Yeah. And, and I do know that there are a lot of people in Harrison who for years have been fighting back against that Image and I've been trying to create a more, uh, more tolerant community in Harrison uh, because there are a lot of people who, uh, who don't agree with the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And, and remember, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan are people uh, who, who don't have deep roots there. I mean, they came, they came to the Ozarks on purpose back in the 70s because it was a place that was almost all white. I mean, they, look, they, could, they could look at a map and look at demographics. And so they, that's, that's what brought them to the Ozarks, and, uh, and a lot of the groups that we have are, have actually come in from other places. Uh, again, it just shows you how connected we are with the rest of the, of the country, and that the Ozarks is, when it comes right down to it, we're not that terribly different than, than other places, especially other places in middle America. Well, I appreciate you uh, sitting through this. Uh, I will, we've got 10 minutes. And I will uh, be glad to sign books really quickly before we get locked in here. And there's an exit. I guess we can always set off the alarm and go off that way. Thank you.